Hi, and welcome back to exercise number five for the Intro to Android App Reverse Engineering Workshop. And we are now in the second half of this workshop and get to focus on native code reversing, which, to be honest, is absolutely my favorite part. So to get started, this first exercise, we're going to actually take a step back and not dive directly into reversing compiled native code in an Android application. First, we're going to actually focus on some of what's happening under the hood, that if you are coming into this with previous compiled or code reverse engineering experience or binary reverse engineering experience, you might not realize this is something you need to know. Um, so when we are talking about reverse engineering native code in an Android app, then what that usually looks like is you have the compiled native library as we talk about in the workshop write up and that library um, contains functions which implement the Java native methods that are declared in the Java code within the app. So the app because it has to exist and start in the Java or Kotlin language it will then call these native methods that have been declared in Java, but are actually implemented in the compiled native libraries. So we need to walk through in this exercise how you do that pairing between the declared native method in Java and the actual code that is executed in the native library. So we're gonna break this down into a, a couple different steps or goals for this exercise. First, we want to declare or find all of the declared native methods in the Java, aka Dex bytecode. Then we need to figure out where do which in which native libraries do those native methods live, because an Android app can load a lot of different native libraries into um, for execution, and thus it's your job as the reverser to figure out in which of these libraries is this native method um, implemented. Then we are going to load the native library into the disassembler, which to do that we have to extract it from the APK because we're using a different tool here than JDEX, which is used to analyze DEX bytecode. We use a disassembler this time to analyze the um, compiled libraries. Lastly, we'll do the final pairing, which is identify the address or name of the function in the native library that is executed whenever the native method is called. So let's get started. For the first steps, we're gonna continue using JDEX, which is what we've used for all the exercises up to this point. So let's open up um, our sample, which is gonna be the mediacode.apk um, in JDEX. So we'll just type JDEX GUI. And then we'll open up mediacode. And my suggestion for how to find native um, or declared native methods in an APK is to use search, which will let this decompile. But for me, the best way to find it, if this finished, is to actually do a search for space native space. Because when you do that, you make sure you're only looking for the native keyword in function declarations rather than a lot of developers may use native um, in terms of method names if it's going to be a, a method or um, variables or other things. So this means you will just find the declarations when you do the search with space native space. And so here we see that for this application it has two different native methods. Um, and what's kind of interesting about this is that we can see they're in two very different package names. One here looks like potentially a common library, whereas the other one is all a bunch of jumbled, scrambled, random letter names, um, which looks more suspicious. So let's walk through this. Let's go ahead and check out the first one first. So here we have our native method declaration in Java, and that's what it will look like each time, is it basically looks like a normal method, but instead of actually being implemented, it has a semicolon as well as the native keyword. So just like with other Java methods, 
we have the method name BS patch. We have what it returns, which in this case is an int, and we have the arguments it takes, so three different strings. The next step here is to see if you can see anywhere around the code um, where a native library is loaded. This is a small class, and we can see right up front here is a system dot load library call. Um, and this value B is set right here to BS patch. So remember from the workshop um, contents or <laughs> materials, load library will just take the string name for the library um, and it assumes that the library lives at the default path of within the APK lib slash CPU type slash lib the name, so in this case BS patch dot SO. So in JDEX, you can see the contents of lib by going to resources. Then we see the directory here. We see a couple different CPU types. But we don't see lib bs patch.so. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but this does happen sometimes. Of, in this case, it might be dead code that's not actually being executed or it's legacy code that's left over and they've removed the native library. Um, but this class is still in the APK. Um, but we don't actually have the implementation. So if BS patch was called right now, um, it would not be able to execute because that native library doesn't exist. So let's go and check out the other one. So here we see it in a whole different patch um, package name. And just like the other one, we have the method name, we have the return type, which in this case is string, and the argument type, and then semicolon to tell us this is a native method declaration. And again, we see in this class it has the load library call. If it wasn't so small and pretty close to on the screen, um, where a native method is, this would be a case where you just look for method calls to system.load or system.library, but we see it here. And again, they're using load library, so um, they assume the library is going to live in the default location, and this time it does. So for the next steps of trying to do the pairing and matching between um, the method, the declared method, and what function in the library is actually called, we're gonna use this native method A, since the library exists. Um, so our next steps here is we need to take a look at what is librrrnad.so and see if we can track it down. So to open up librrrnad.so and analyze it, we're going to use Ghidra, a disassembler tool instead of JDEX. Because remember, JDEX is used for analyzing um, Java bytecode and we're now moving into non-Java code. Instead, it's a compiled C or C++. So first, though, we need to get the library on its own because it's still packaged in the APK. So we're gonna open up a new tab, go to our samples directory, and we're gonna make a new directory to unpack media code. So I'm just gonna call it this, and then I'm gonna copy a a copy <laughs> of media code into our new directory, cd into our new directory, and then just call unzip on the APK. And so this has extracted all of the contents of the APK here into our directory, and if we go into lib, we'll see that it has each of the different CPUs. So I'm gonna just analyze army ABI, because as we discussed in the workshop, that's just what they call quote unquote generic ARM 32-bit. Um, if you're more comfortable with x86, go ahead and choose the x86 library. Um, but note that most handheld mobile phones nowadays do run on ARM, so it's a good thing to get up to speed on. So now let's open up Ghidra. Ghidra is a free open source decompiler um, and disassembler, so best used for analyzing compiled code, and it was recently open sourced in April, which was really exciting, by the US NSA, National Security Agency. And so let's walk through how to get started with Ghidra. Um, note, there are a lot of great more in-depth resources, um, some which I cite in the workshop, so I highly suggest you check those out. I still use IDA Pro as my main daily 
disassembler and decompiler, so I do not know and use all of the tips and tricks of Ghidra, um, but I'm working on it. And, uh, and so, but Ida Pro is many thousands of dollars a year where Ghidra is free. Um, so that's why this workshop is based on Ghidra. So first thing we got to do is we got to create a project. So projects and Ghidra's keep all of your analyses together in sort of one directory or one file. So we're going to say new project. We're going to say it's non-shared. If you are multiple reverse engineers working together on reverse engineering the same set of files or binaries, that's when you use a shared project and it creates a collaboration sort of version control server for you all to work together. I think it's one of the best features of Ghidra compared to other tools. But in this case, it's non-shared, so we'll click next. Choose your directory and then create a project name. So we can call this exercise five or media code or whatever. We create a directory. So the next thing we need to do is we want to click on the dragon. Oh wait, no we don't. We want to import a file first. I'm um, sorry, because we need a file to analyze. Um, and so we are going to go back to where we extracted um, our media code libraries to. And as I said, I'm going to choose the Army ABI version and import that. And it, by default, found that it's ARM, little Indian, 32-bit. So it's going to open that up for us. We can keep hitting OK. And now we can click on the Dragon, which is our code browser, aka sort of the best, the interface for um, analyzing, reverse engineering, etc. Oops. I did that wrong. Sorry. I needed to click on this file first. Double click on that instead of just go to the code browser, otherwise you have to import again. So you could have done either way. Um, it has not been analyzed. Would you like to analyze it? Yes. And we're just going to leave all the defaults and click analyze. At this point we're not doing reverse in-depth in reverse engineering, remember? We're starting with just trying to find the pairing between that Java native or Java declared native method and what function here is executed each time that native method single letter A is called that we saw in JDEX. So remember there's two ways to do the pairing between Java native methods and what function is executed. So I over clicked here in our symbol tree opened up functions. Oops. See if I can make this a little bit bigger. And so remember that there's either the static pairing or registering or dynamic. And so static is the easiest to look for because it means that the function is start starts with Java underscore and then you know the class name and the method name. So we can quickly scroll through all of our um, methods here to see if we can find any functions that are named Java underscore, and we don't see that. We could also filter here by doing Java underscore, and nothing's there. So the next step is to, is that, okay, they're not doing um, that type of registering, so they'll have to use the register natives API. And if you remember in the workshop we talk about the different arguments that the register natives um, API has to take, and that includes the method name um, as well as the signature. In our case, remember, the method name is A, which is not going to be very easy and might not be identified as string in Ghidra since it's just a single byte. So instead we're going to use the signature to see if we can track down since that has to be passed up um, register natives. So if we go back to Ghidra, so to show any strings you go to the window top menu and then go to define strings. And that opens up this screen of all of the strings that Ghidra has identified in the ELF library. So 
we will start by doing searching for the signature. So as we talked about the signature, we'll first have um, parentheses to, um, to indicate arguments. And in JDEX, the argument that is passed to A is string. And when it is a non-primitive type like string, you start with a capital letter J, I mean L, and then write out the full um, class name of the object. So it's Java slash lang slash string, semicolon. That's our only argument. So then we close the parentheses, and then it returns type void, so we type V. And there's one instance of this string in the L. So we see it here in this screen on the right is the reference, and we can see there's a single cross-reference to it. Um, we can get cross-references by, what's that? I was just using my Ida bindings versus my Ghidra bindings since I accidentally always switch back and forth. And we see the cross-reference here, so let's just double-click it. We can go to it. Um, and so we double click it to go to it, X out, and it brings us to the disassemble, the disassembled instruction that references L Java Lang string. And what's interesting is this is in register natives. So one of the selling points of Ghidra is that not only does it give you this disassembly listing here by default, but it has built-in free decompilers. So if we X out of our defined strings, then we can see back the decompiled view, which gets you up to a higher level of sort of pseudo C, pseudo C++ code. And so we see here is the reference um, to the string. So you might notice this function is named register natives. It is not the Java native interface register natives API call. And you can also notice that because if you go into the docs and look at register natives in the Oracle documentation, register natives would have a capital R. This is a function that the developers of this library named register natives, which is a helpful hint. Um, but I wanted to still walk y'all through this process in case, um, for example, the developers had stripped the names. So what we see is they're putting onto the stack three um, values here which makes sense because when we talked about um, the arguments that register natives takes, it's going to require the, the Java declared native method name, which if we look here is going to be a single letter A because it was a single letter A, that's why Ghidra did not identify it as, as string. We can tell it here that it is a string terminated C string. So now it sees it. Then we have our signature here and so this right here is the address or our function of the um, function that is executed whenever this Java declared native method called. In the disassembly, we will see it here. And that's one of the nice things here about Ghidra as well is it's gonna help you coordinate between the disassembly and the decompiler. And so we could go to this pointer, which is saying it holds the address to native set app key plus one. Um, if you're wondering about the plus one, that is a arm attribute, which is saying, hey, when we call and branch to native set app key, we're switching between thumb modes. Um, so you can read up more about that, but no, it is not jumping into um, one byte into native set app key, it is starting execution at native set app key. So at this point, we now know that whenever the Java call code calls this method, which we could see its usage right here. So when it calls this method here, it is actually executing native set app key function in this code right here. So you would then be able to analyze if you're interested in understanding what it's doing, um, this code to see how the app works. And next, we will work on reverse engineering um, one of these functions in the next exercise.